uh, Island Housing Planner. Whoops, got it. Thank you, Lucy. Welcome everyone. <laughs> I'm Laura Silber. I am the Island Housing Planner for the Martha's Vineyard Commission. And this is the launch for the Martha's Vineyard Commission Housing Action Task Force. Um, Lucy's gonna be running the tech for the meeting. She'll be also monitoring the chat and helping to identify hands for questions. If you do have a question, if you could please try to use your reaction button and raise your little yellow hand, it's a lot easier for her to see when she's scanning across because we have, we're up to three pages now of, uh, of attendees. Um, this meeting's being recorded. We will be posting the recording to the MV Commission YouTube channel for public access. So um, feel free to find that and share it with your friends and colleagues. And the materials that we're sharing tonight are now posted to the Martha's Vineyard Commission website on the housing page. So if anyone would like to use those as resources for your agency or entity, please feel free to do so. Um, we do wanna note, we're sorry, we were unable to provide interpretation services tonight, but we are actively working on updating our tech so that we will be able to provide simultaneous closed caption translation. We hope to have that ready for the next meeting. Um, we have a number of guests here tonight who are joining us who will be sharing their housing effort highlights to help inform the Martha's Vineyard discussion um, in order. Those will be Senator Julian Sear. From Provincetown, we have Select Board Member Leslie Sandberg and Assistant Town Manager Dan Riviello. From Housing to Protect Cape Cod and the Islands and Housing Assistance Corporation, CEO Alyssa Magnana, who also co-chaired Governor Healy's housing transition team. And then we have Nantucket Municipal Housing Directors, Tucker Holland. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, after those folks give us a, um, present, a brief presentation of what they're working on, we have a state of housing um, PowerPoint that'll show us where we are right now on Martha's Vineyard. And then we've got, um, 10 areas of focus we've identified to kind of kick off the discussion. So if you could please hold your questions till the end, um, or if you think you're gonna forget them, please drop them into the chat and then we can go through them in the chat. Um, so right now I'd like to introduce Martha's Vineyard Commission Executive Director, Adam Turner to get us started. Thank you, Laura, and welcome. Um, man, the turnout was great. I, I didn't have any idea what we would we would do with this. We've been having sort of housing meetings uh, with a smaller group and decided to sort of expand it um, and, and um, welcome. You know, housing is, is um, certainly one of the most important issues on Martha's Vineyard, if not the most important. Um, there are those who say climate change is, and um, we have sort of structured this, uh, this group after our climate change task force. And the real, uh, model that that um, that we've used to uh, differentiate this group from some of the others that we've done has just broadened it out that we decided with the climate change that just having you know a, a, the normal uh, groups and 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 personnel that we normally work with which is just town officials and others that we weren't getting the, the full uh, breadth of the of the issues. So we broadened it out and we have law enforcement people, we have service providers, we have other stakeholders and and you know everybody's got a perspective, whether you're a, a business owner or uh, whether you are a a um a person looking to find housing and wondering whether you're going to be successful as you as you go somewhere else this summer. So um we are, you know, this group is basically to review housing information, uh, discuss housing issues, and um, and then, you know, uh, talk about solutions. Some of those things are going to be shorter term, others will be longer term. Um, we're not looking to recommend uh, anything to specific towns or specific bodies. We're putting the, the, the whole breadth of the solution out there and um, and we are the staff, so we will provide information um, and we will uh, get you the things that you need to make good decisions. Uh, we do you know, have a lot of regulatory authority um, on our plate. You know, when we get a development, we look at housing and we look at that and we are updating our, our regulations and our, our things, but we're also, um, Getting information, and, and I think Lauren was here going to talk about that. Getting information 
uh, about about uh, numbers and, and short-term rental revenues and and short-term rent, term rental uh, housing numbers and other kinds of things that are going to be uh, informational and you know provide sort of a scope of what of what the situation is on the island. We're also looking at you know at some point you know maybe you know commuting records, any kind of thing that's going to tell us you know give us a, a perspective on housing and. Uh, no, this is not going to be, uh, uh, like I said, some will be short term, some will be longer. We're not going to fix everything or even address anything tonight. Tonight, I think, is just to get to know each other. We'll prevent, present some information. But I also look forward to working, and I, I just want to make it clear that um, we're here to work with this group. We're here to work with the towns. We're the staff. And um, anything that you need or any information that you want, um, speak up. And we will uh, we will try to do it. I again want to compliment you all for giving some of your time. And um, Laura, back to you. Thank you. So I'm going to give a very quick swipe of the efforts that the 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 commission is currently working on, and then I'm going to turn it over to Senator Sear. So as Adam mentioned, we have the Joint Affordable Housing Group, which includes all the island housing committees, DCRHA, IHT, Dukes County Health Council, and the county, among other agencies. This group is sharing initiatives, priority and goal setting, um, and working on um, progress updates with each other so that the town affordable housing committees are really communicating. Um, we're actively working with the town of West Tisbury on developing their aid for ADUs program, and we have an update plan to the 2020 housing needs assessment. Um, we're also assisting different towns with master plans or at various stages of, um, of that process. The, um, for the planning boards, we have a scope of work ready to go out for an island-wide short-term rental study, which the planning boards have requested. We have an update underway for the 2014 affordable housing zoning assessment. We've worked with all six planning boards, um, developing and discussing timeshare and fractional ownership research and bylaws. Two towns have now, one's adopted, another one, um, has actively proposed. Uh, we're working on updating accessory apartment and ADU bylaws with the towns and other town specific requests. On a regional and state level, we're working with the Housing to Protect Cape Cod and the Islands Initiative. And we, uh, Alyssa, Alyssa had to log off. So Marissa Sear is here. She's the, um, she is the chief of staff. So she'll be talking about that. We're working with MARPA, Massachusetts Association of Regional Planning Agencies or district legislators and statewide groups to elevate Martha's Vineyard's needs in upcoming legislation. We're working with the Rural Policy Advisory Council on state level, and we are actively in discussion sharing resources with Nantucket and Provincetown. And with that, I will turn it over to our Senator, Julian Sear. Uh, good evening. Uh, it's really nice to be with um... See so many friends from the island uh, on here, and and, and folks, um, you know, making time on this most essential issue, especially on uh, what is a a gorgeous, gorgeous day. Um, hope, hopefully, folks got to enjoy it. Uh, I'm I'm, I'm uh, really delighted, and I'll give you some updates and, and my thinking here on this issue. Uh, I'm not going to be able to say that the whole meeting that the Senate is taking up. Um, uh, we're in the midst of our budget debate, uh, so the biggest thing we do every year is take up our now uh, 56 billion dollar budget uh and we have an amendment deadline um tomorrow at uh 2 p.m so so we got a lot of work to do in my office uh but really thrilled um that, that this conversation is, is sort of happening um you know you will hear later you don't need to hear from me what a dire situation um not only we have in martha's vineyard or in nantucket or on the outer cape but really across the region in eastern massachusetts um you know broadly and unfortunately you know this is really because of a failure uh, a failure in leadership uh, to anticipate these needs and issues, uh, you know, in 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 the last several decades. Um, you know, I remember, uh, you know, when I was in middle school, right, over 20 years ago, um, I was that kid who'd come home and read the local paper because uh, that was the kind of kid I was, right? I remember reading about the housing crisis um, at the time, um, where ideas that you know we're trying to get still get done today were, were being talked about. Um, you know, and a lot of what's transpired and the inaction I think we've seen uh, in, in those subsequent decades has put us in a very challenging spot. Um, and we're going to have to marshal every and all resource as an island uh, and as a region to, you know, really push back against um, a, a persistent nimbyism, which, you know, I think has, has unfortunately, uh, you know, 
people, especially on my side of the political aisle, you know, for too often have hid behind uh, conservationism and historic preservation and environmentalism, um, when really this has been about preserving, uh, limiting the supply of housing to preserve, uh, to ensure that people who currently own homes, uh, the value continues to accrue. Um, and when you live in an island, when you live in a peninsula and there's only so much land to be built, um, we're now in a position where, um, you know, year round people cannot make a life on the island. When you look at islanders of my generation, um, millennials and Generation Z, um, we're now in a position where, you know, you need to make hundreds of thousands of dollars as a household to be able to um, even dream of affording to be able to own a home. Uh, and I can relate to this, right? I, my, I'm from Truro, it's my hometown. In my own hometown, to be able to afford to buy a home in my hometown, I would have to make, um, or it's my family unit would have to make, but it's just me, I'm single uh, at the time, um, you know, would have to make over $400,000. That's completely out of reach. And, 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 and it's the same on the island, if not worse. And so what really gives me encouragement is to see the consensus I think we've seen on the island um, with actions that are, that are taken. And I really should give a huge shout out to Martha's Vineyard Commission for um, really wading into uh, this really challenging, the toughest of issues we have. And, and Adam, you have been such a great partner to me and to my office uh, on a myriad of issues. Um, and it's great to have Laura uh, bringing her expertise and her uh, organizing chutzpah to this effort. Um, so I'm excited about this conversation. Let me talk to you a little bit about what I see kind of the three, the three things that we need to be considering um, to, to, to build housing and to preserve housing um, you know, on the island. And really this applies across the region. Uh, so this starts with infrastructure. We then number two need to think about revenue. How do we pay for this? Uh, and then three, what are the real specific tangible policy um, uh, policy changes that we're going to make on infrastructure when it comes to housing, uh, particularly in, in a fragile environment like Martha's Vineyard, uh, where you got a lot of estuaries and embayments and lagoons. Uh, the key linchpin here um, is 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 water infrastructure and particularly wastewater infrastructure. Uh, fortunately, especially the down island towns have um, have a municipal water supply, uh, but really wastewater is the absolute key here. Wastewater allows you to build uh, more densely uh, to have housing that's geared towards year round working people and families uh, and also doing it in a way that, that is not further putting uh, nitrogen and phosphorus into, uh, into our, our, our environment, especially a marine environment. Uh, Martha's Vineyard has the opportunity to join uh, the Cape Cotton Islands Water Protection Fund. This was a fund uh, that was established in law in 2018 uh, by myself and Representative Sarah Peak and Representative Fernand Dylan Fernandez and the entire Cape Cod delegation. Uh, it takes a, a, it puts a surcharge on all rooms uh, on Cape Cod, a 2.75% surcharge on all rooms, uh, and those dollars are funneled into a region-wide fund to help offset the cost of uh, wastewater and water quality projects, um, particularly related to sewering, but also other efforts that would clean up lagoons. Uh, all six vineyard towns have the ability to join this fund um, with a vote of their select board. Uh, and Martha's Vineyard Commission is doing a lot of good work to um, make sure that the towns are able to qualify for this and to able to join the fund. Um, but wastewater infrastructure is one of the biggest things from a state level um, that we can help out and lend a hand with uh, when it comes to building, uh, building the housing that we need and particularly uh, the denser housing that's consistent with our you know, um, island villages, right? With what, what Vineyard Haven and OB and, and uh, you know, Circuit Ave looks like and, and in Edgar Town. Uh, so infrastructure is one. Um, the second is you need a revenue source, right? We need to come up with a pretty significant amount of money uh, to build new housing, to build the denser new housing that we need uh, and to also to, to preserve housing, right? Too much of our housing is, you know, the real problem we face, right? Is that housing is valued on the island as it valued is on the region. It's not valued based on, you know, what someone can afford for a given year or pay month to month, right? It's, 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 it's valued based on what someone's willing to pay by the night, especially in July and in August. Uh, and so that creates a completely out of whack scenario. We wanna find ways to um, preserve year round housing. 
Uh, but you got to be able to pay for that, right? If you're going to build things, if you're going to preserve things, you need money. Um, this is where uh, the idea of a transfer fee on luxury real estate, uh, that in the case of Martha's Vineyard, would go into a housing bank. I assume all of you are very familiar with this effort. Uh, and I bet many of you um, joined us when we had 300 plus islanders strong in the state house. Uh, so, so that's really key, right? But the the revenue is essential. And there's other stable revenue sources that island towns should look at. Um, specifically, your room occupancy local option tax is something that um, many towns, you'll hear from um, Nantucket, you'll hear from Provincetown, if you talk to folks in Barnstable, these towns have all dedicated their room occupancy dollars or a portion of these room occupancy dollars towards housing um, or towards uh, wastewater infrastructure. That's another revenue source. So you want to think about infrastructure, you want to think about revenue, we're going to work to get this transfer to be done uh, on Beacon Hill, um, but the uh, room segregating of room occupancy is something you could do right now, and maybe our friends from P Town will talk about that. Uh, and then the third piece, right, are these very significant real policy changes, right? Um, and because land use policy and zoning in Massachusetts, um, these are not decisions that we make on Beacon Hill, and, and we unfortunately, uh, for better or worse, maybe probably for worse, right? Um, can't fix this problem in its entirety. It's really up to each municipality um, to determine land use and, and zoning. And so this is going to require a change in our zoning, right? Allowing us to build um, denser housing in our existing villages. Uh, that's that that's focused on on for people for year round housing. Um, you know, it's looking at novel issues, and I really applaud the folks on the island looking at um, the the timeshare issue, which is just starting to percolate but could be really dangerous for us. Uh, it's taking a real hard look at short-term rentals, which you know, a lot of islanders uh, you know, look through the shuffle and rely on to make ends meet. Um, but really, I think the, the, the fact that our housing is valued by what it rents for by the night in the summer is, is really adversely affecting us. Um, municipalities have had the authority to regulate short-term rentals, to limit them in some way since 2018. Um, and, and, and none of our communities have really done that, in part, I think, because there's so much money behind this. And if you want an example of that, uh, go, go take a look at what's happening on Nantucket um, and the amount of kind of money that's sort of swirling around uh, on that issue. Um, but a whole host of other policy matters that can be taken up um, from zoning changes to deed restrictions, uh, looking at um, property tax uh, incentives that give uh, landlords who are renting uh, to year-round people at affordable rates, uh, give them a, a, a break on their property taxes. The bottom line here is the problem that we face is so big, there is no one silver bullet. And so we're gonna need an all of the above approach on these policies from zoning to ADUs by right, uh, to the deed restriction pieces to others. Um, what we are up against here, I'll close on this, is, is quite steep. Um, and, and in part because of the inaction uh, because it's taken us so long to realize what's going on, um, I really worry about our, our, our ability to truly uh, fix this problem. And I think that what it's really going to take is a real level of political courage, of rejecting um, you know, a really persistent and misguided nimbyism that is really upending the ability, particularly of people in my generation and younger generations, um, to even envision a life on the island. Um, and you all know, I see people on, you know, this Zoom tonight, right? Think about how you came to the island, whether you were born there, whether you came over. I, I'm sure there's some great stories there, right? I can assure you how you did it would likely not be possible today. And so that should be our, 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 our clarion call, our motivation for um, the swift and rapid shift that we need to take to preserve the viability of our community to ensure that all six towns on the island are places that can sustain a vibrant year-round community that can provide services to um, our population, particularly the older population that we have. So we've got a really big task ahead of us. I'm really encouraged to see each and every one of you here. And I really wanna ask you to stay engaged, to demand better um, from uh, folks like me uh, and also to demand better um, of our towns and what we can all do together. So thanks to the Martha's Vineyard Commission for pulling this together. Um, I'm actually going to be on island this coming Monday. Looking forward to uh, maybe seeing some of you folks then. And just really want to thank all of you for the opportunity to be here and um, look forward to 
uh, conspiring and, and co-conspiring with, with all of you uh, to make some big uh, urgently needed change happen in the housing space. So Laura, back to you. Thanks so much, Senator. Um, so there's some really, really interesting things happening in Provincetown and Nantucket. Um, they get referred to a lot as sort of on the cutting edge of how to address some of these really challenging problems. So we invited um, representatives from both towns to come tonight and give you kind of like a brief rundown of these innovative things that they're working on. So um, Leslie Sandberg, who's a uh, Provincetown's select board member and Dan Riviello, assistant town manager, are both on. And they will go first and then um, Tucker Holland from Nantucket will go. Leslie. Thanks, Laura. Hi, everybody. How are you all tonight? Um, Provincetown, Nantucket, and Martha's Vineyard, believe it or not, are more similar than, you, than you'd think. I mean, I think a lot of people out here, because of Provincetown being so far out, see us as an island. And uh, sometimes we don't mind that. Um, in fact, we like it. So I just, I want to thank, first off, Laura and Adam for arranging this meeting and inviting us to come. In the last two years, Provincetown is, we've made some really great strides to address the housing crisis because we're losing many year rounders and businesses are suffering due to the lack of workforce and seasonal housing. We've got a really, we've got a really tough situation out here. But we also have problems with town hall, staffing our town hall and our departments. And we're also looking at um, soon to have a full-time fire department where I think we're the last town in the Commonwealth to have a volunteer uh, firefighting force. And we don't know where we're going to house them, the new, the new people that come in full-time. So we basically, I guess you could say necessity is the mother of invention. Let me give you an idea of, of how much uh, the price of a home is in Provincetown. The median home price in Provincetown is just over $1.9 million. Uh, there was a condo, a two bedroom condo uh, recently that went for $1.3 million. So we are, it's crazy. We're a destination place and uh, the skyrocketing prices coupled with very little inventory has put pressure in our year round community. And also because we have 70% of our area out here is national seashore. We are really have uh, not a lot of land to build on. So, but we did not, we're not gonna let these challenges get in our way. Uh, we're gonna do, we've been, the select board that I've been on for the last couple of years, we've really been focusing on housing. And we are going to try to find attainable housing for all income levels, the affordable, the missing middle, and also seasonal. So we basically, um, we're gonna let you know tonight what we've done. And, if, and what I also wanna say to y'all is, Look, you guys can do this. If Provincetown can do this, you can do this. But what I would say to you is don't delay. There was a lot of delay in this town before the board, our most recent board started taking action. And that delay is we've lost some very important people and some businesses. And I just want you to know that please don't delay. And if you need any help with everything going forward, let us know. And we're here to help you. We come out to the island if you want us to. We'll be here for you for meetings. And I just wanted to let you know that you can really get this done. It just takes you, it just, it just started. That's all. If you start it, suddenly everything flows. So basically, um, Provincetown, what I'm going to talk about is a year-round market rental housing trust, deed restrictions, transportation, and then I'm going to talk about our, how our short-term rental revenue is dedicated. Dan's going to talk about affordable housing and uh, projects that we've got in the pipeline and a couple other things. So right now, Provincetown has a year-round market rate trust that was created by a home rule petition in like 2015. It was established to create and preserve year-round rental units in our town including but not limited to market rate units. And that's for the benefit of the town. That's in addition to our affordable housing trust that we have. Basically it handles housing for people who make between 80% and 200% AMI. Uh, currently this trust owns a former timeshare complex with 26 units for market rate housing. All the units are occupied. We have people that work for the town there we have people that are on their, our police force there, and we have just people, we have small businesses, both small business owners there. But this trust can do more than just that. So what we're, what we're doing and what we did in this last town meeting is that we had a home rule petition 
to uh, create the ability for year-round housing occupancy restrictions. Basically what our home rule petition did is it would allow Provincetown to create a year-round deed restriction program to create dedicated year-round housing inventory. It would be managed by this trust, the year-round market rate housing trust. They would work with the select board and this voluntary program would allow the town to purchase deed restrictions from homeowners and developers to permanently limit the occupancy of a given unit via year-round housing occupancy restriction for rental or housing ownership. The idea is we've got to start creating housing inventory for year-rounders, and this is one way to do it. It's We were thinking it's, it's kind of the carrot approach. It's a financial incentive. One possibility is to work with people that already own their homes and developers. The other way possibility is we have a lot of people that can afford the mortgage payment, but they can't afford the down payment. So the other possibility is we could offer people financial help with this program for their with their down payment. And we'll say, look, we'll help you with your down payment if you put a deed restriction on the home. And we've talked to some people in town, and there are people who would actually want to bite at this program. So with a deed restriction like that, the property would be occupied by an owner or renter who lived at the property year round, and there's no area median income restrictions, none whatsoever. That's also a good thing. So that's what we do. And also with deed restrictions, I've worked with, I work, have worked with Laura and Tucker Holland, and we put together language about creating the ability for municipalities to purchase deed restrictions in a legislative proposal that Senator Sear has sponsored and he's filed. And the idea is it's gonna create the category and the ability to do it. That's all the legislation does. It doesn't prescribe what all towns have to do. It creates the ability to do a deed restriction deed restriction program, and then gives towns and other municipalities the ability to create a program that best fits their needs. We also have a transportation pilot program. What we found is due to the lack of seasonal housing, many people live outside of Provincetown. They live anywhere from Provincetown down to East Ham, some as far as Harwich. The Cape Cod Regional Transit Authority does run buses to our town, but there are transportation gaps that made it hard for workers to get transportation. And the last thing we wanted is if you can't live here, there were some people that were getting gouged in their drive home at night if they worked in the restaurant industry, or it was hard for people to come if they if they worked the morning shift at a B&B. &B. The gaps were early morning, 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. and late night, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. So we worked, the town and the select board worked with the Cape Cod Regional Transit Authority. And now there's a pilot program to fill those gaps in service to help people who live on the Outer Cape have safe, reliable, and affordable transportation to and from Provincetown during our busy season. It, this extra, these extra gaps that are being filled are really from May through October. And I will let you know the result. Last weekend was our first weekend, and we had 20 riders that took it. And so we were very happy with that. We also have filed, like you guys have filed, a home rule petition for uh, the transfer fee on all real estate sales. We are transfer fee, would those proceeds be divided between our affordable housing trust and the year round market rate housing trust that I just spoke on. So we're trying to, to funnel money as much as we can to housing. We also, I don't know if you all know this, but the Massachusetts rental law that exists in Mass General Law allows communities to impose an additional 3% community impact fee on short-term rental units, which meets the Commonwealth's de de definition of a professionally managed unit. What does that mean? It applies to short-term rentals that are have one or two or one of two or more short-term rental units. So if you have two to three or, or four or five going upwards, you are considered a, and it's the same operator, you're considered a professionally managed unit and you will be charged an additional 3% community impact fee. And the, that was passed at our town meeting in 2022 and it started this January. So we'll see how that goes. We also, the big money is how do we fund everything? Short-term rental revenue. Last year, Provincetown brought in um, $5,073,380 from, from our rooms, our room rental revenue. And we have dedicated that. In Provincetown, we have dedicated um, all that money to five different categories. 
We fund tourism with that. We fund, put money into the general fund for that. We put money into our capital stab stabilization account, our sewer fund, and we also have um, a housing fund that we do. And that's 30% of what we bring in. So last year, $1,522,014 would go into housing. That housing money then goes either to the Affordable Housing Trust or the year-round market rate rental housing trust. And what happens is, is the select board has them come, the two um, committees come to us, talk about what their plans are, and then we split up the money depending on the projects and the priority and what the need is that we have. And um, I also wanna say that though, our general fund, this room rental in money that goes into our general fund, $600,000 of that is used to pay the uh, debt on our Harbor Hill property, which is in, that timeshare unit that had the 26 unit timeshare um, complex that's in our market rate trust. So basically we have trying to dedicate as much money as we can to housing. We're using it with short-term rental uh, revenue. And I'm now gonna flip it over to Dan. So he's gonna talk about um, a little bit more about short-term rental study that we're doing and our affordable housing projects. Thank you all, Dan. Thanks, Leslie. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm going to go quickly through uh, a couple of things here. So one of the things that Senator Sear mentioned that I actually didn't even have written down is that uh, in Provincetown, we did at a special town meeting this fall, we did pass our uh, sewer expansion. So we're going to be going townwide with sewer. Uh, it'll be available to every property in town by 2030. And that's really going to help with any additional housing efforts uh, that we try to do. One of the other things we did is that we have a residential exemption in Provincetown. In 2018, we expanded that to include uh, folks that own property in town that rent to someone year round. So if you have a year round rental, um, you can also get the same property tax exemption as you would get for um, having uh, your home as your primary residence. And then just this past spring at town meeting, we expanded that even further because we realized there was a sort of an issue where if you had multiple properties on the same parcel of land, you could only get one residential exemption. So if I owned this unit and I lived here as my primary residence, but I owned another unit on the same parcel and I rented it out year round, I couldn't get the residential exemption on both. We've changed that now so that you can get uh, up to four uh, if you own multiple units on one parcel. So we're hoping that will entice more people into doing uh, year round rentals. A couple of things we're doing on the development side. Uh, three Jerome Smith is a planned 65 unit new construction multifamily development um, that's going to be targeting um, 60 and 80 percent AMI with a handful of market rate units. Um, we also just released a RFP for 26 Shank Painter, which is the site of uh, currently the site of our police station. The police station will be moving to a new site uh, next year. And so we uh, put that out for an RFP where we're hoping to find someone to uh, create at least 24, but up to 36 middle income uh, year round rental housing units. Uh, we also uh, did a pretty detailed study of our Veterans Memorial Community Center and the town parcel surrounding it to see what might be developable. Um, so we got some results back and we found an area of uh, that's sort of on a municipal parking lot that's underutilized and also a strip of land next to that where we think we can get about six to 12 townhouse units. And so we're gonna be moving forward on that as soon as we can figure out the, uh, the logistics with that site. And then we'll be going back to that larger study later because it identified additional parcels around the VMCC that could be used um, for housing. And then just a couple more things. Uh, we, town meeting, we bought uh, some more land that is under inclusionary zoning will allow up to 15 units to be built. So there's currently a couple of uh, residents on that property and we're relocating them. And we'll be putting out an RFP for that 288A Bradford Street site. And then we have a private developer who's working on their uh, barracks project in town. Uh, this is a private development that's going to create 28 dormitory style units, which will house 112 people uh, and will also contain 16 year round apartments. And then the last thing I'll mention is that we're currently engaged in a study with the UMass Donahue Institute. Um, and they're looking at our housing market and the effects of short term rentals on the market. So they're looking at 
um, the evolution of the housing market impacts that short-term rentals are having, and then possible consequences of any restrictions we put in place. And we're hoping to have that report by August or September. So uh, that's all for me. I'll throw it back to Laura. Yep. And thank you all. We're not able, well, before Laura, before you talk, we're not able to stay, yeah. but we want to let you know we're around. And the one last thing I want to say is you're all, for those of you who are with municipalities, look and ask for your inventory of your land, because you may find land that has not been thought of that you can actually build on. And that's include underutilized parking lots. Thank you all. I'm sorry I have to go. It's been a pleasure and thank you so much for everything. Laura. Thanks, thank you. Everyone. Thanks Leslie. Thanks, Dan. Really appreciate it. Um, we're gonna move very quickly to Tucker Holland because I know he has to go. Um, Tucker, do you wanna share? You, Nantucket just passed an extraordinary amount of um, warrant articles for housing at this most recent town meeting and last year as well. Uh, thanks, Laura. Uh, it's great to be with you all again. It was especially great to be with so many of you up at the State House um, back in March. Um, Leslie and Dan have given you a lot of different ideas and programs. I'm going to try not to repeat things um, about Nantucket that we are doing similarly to Provincetown. I guess a couple of things that might um, just illustrate the emphasis that we've had here in re recent years. And I'll, I will echo one thing that Leslie said. Um, I encourage you to start now, to go as quickly as you are able to go. Um, Laura and I talk often about how Martha's Vineyard is lucky. They have a crystal ball. It's called Nantucket. And right now our median home price is in excess of $3 million. So it, starting in 2019, we really got serious here about starting to address the issue. And since that time, town meeting has approved roughly $70 million toward housing efforts, um, the full range up to 200% AMI thus far. We actually just passed a Warren article for a home rule petition to change the upper limit of what our trust can serve to 240% AMI. Town meeting on Saturday also approved a six and a half million dollar permanent override for housing. Um, that measure still needs to pass at the ballot in a couple of weeks, um, but if passed, and it passed quite handily at town meeting, um, those funds could potentially be used to be bonded uh, against and could be generating roughly, you know, 50 to $100 million towards addressing the issue. I think Leslie spoke about how we cannot um, solely build our way out of the problem. We really need to repurpose existing inventory, which in more recent years has been flowing out of year round hands and into investor or seasonal uh, buyer hands. Um, we really view it critical in Nantucket that we create a bifurcated market um, and have enough inventory within that uh, to reach a stasis um, and provide what the community needs uh, to support its economy and the year round community. Uh, we are in the process of uh, doing uh, a number of different projects. One I'll mention most recently, a 64 unit project um, has received its funding from um, state subsidies, uh, low income housing tax credits, and that will be moving forward with some additional support uh, from the $70 million I previously mentioned. One thing that Laura wanted me to touch on as well, what I've been speaking about so far has to do, of course, with year-round housing, but we also have uh, appropriated roughly $9 million towards the creation of some seasonal housing for the town, uh, and that will house most likely our lifeguards and perhaps some summer police officers. And it will have a couple of year round apartments in there sort of for management personnel. 
Um, and that is being bid out right now and construction is expected to start uh, early part of 2024. Um, I will kind of leave it at that. I know you guys have a lot to talk about. I will mention, I actually will be on the vineyard next Friday and Saturday. Um, and Julian doesn't know it, but we have a bet that if I run a Boston qualifying time at your marathon, he is going to get the transfer fee passed. So if anyone would like to get together while I'm there, please reach out to Laura and I'm happy to connect and answer further questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tucker. Um, now, Tucker's done a lot on municipal employee housing, which I know came up recently in the town of Edgartown. So anyone who's on from Edgartown who wants to connect to set up meetings with Tucker to go over this, I'm more than happy to facilitate and any of the other towns as well. Um, so we're gonna quickly go to Marissa Sear, um, Julian happens to be Julian's sister, same, same last name. Um, yeah. <laughs> Alisa Magnata was not able to join us. So Marissa is working with Alyssa on housing to protect Cape Cod and the islands, which is a region wide effort that's representing to state level that Nantucket, Provincetown and, and the Martha's Vineyard Commission are all involved with along with the Cape Cod Commission, Cape Cod Chamber of Commerce and the Island Chambers of Commerce. Marissa, do you wanna give a brief overview of what you're working on? Sure, uh, thank, thank you, you, Laura. And um, just uh, Elisa is actually at one of um, our HPCCs, their acronym for the, the group, the coalition. We have an event tonight, so she's at that. We'll have a, happy ha a housing happy hour. So um, bringing together housing advocates to kind of talk about the issue. So that's why she can't be here. Um, but yeah, as Laura mentioned, um, just giving a quick overview of, of Housing with Cape Cod and, um, and what, what we're doing, why we were created. Um, so we were formed back in 2020, um, really to educate and engage, um, you know, our residents and our region about how we need to turn, turn the tide on the housing crisis. And, you know, from housing assistance perspective, we're, um, you know, the regional housing agency for Cape Cod and Island. So we were really seeing this firsthand with folks coming to our doors, you know, with no, with no options, nowhere to go. And, you know, coming to the realization that we need to really address some of the systemic issues and come together as a region to, to work together um, on this. So the coalition was formed um, and we have um, five founding organizations, um, including the Chamber, Cape Built, um, Home Builders and Remodelers, and the Cape Islands Association of Realtors, in addition to housing assistance. Um, and what we focus on, uh, what we have been focusing on, um, several different kind of buckets. Um, one is supporting, you know, state initiatives. Um, a lot of kind of what's been talked about here, having sort of a plan for what policies we want to support at the state, getting behind those and moving those forward. Um, we've also facilitated a regional effort and um, Laura um, and Tucker have both participated in those meetings where we're really bringing together leaders from across the region, different business um, leaders, nonprofits, you know, housing, outside of housing, but everyone who's sort of impacted by the housing crisis. We know this is our entire community, right? Um, so we've been we've been facilitating like regional meetings, and those have been really great. Um, you know, especially having the islands' perspectives at those meetings has been really impactful because you all really are, um, you know, unfortunately several steps ahead of where we are on the Cape. So what you're doing and kind of the steps you're taking have been really. Um, helpful for us in terms of framing what we can do and sort of like Tucker said, you know, start now, don't wait until you're, um, you know, until the, until the crisis is even worse. So that's kind of the, the perspective we're trying to take. Um, so there's sort of the state, the state level, the regional level, and then we're also working on the local level in a couple different ways. One is um, working on training municipal leaders. So um, we did a great session with Leslie Sandberg and Tucker on housing trusts that we did with um, municipal leaders across Cape Cod about how they work, how you can, you know, increase the AMI levels, um, you know, really utilize that money to support housing in a more broad way. Um, so trying to educate our municipal leaders on what opportunities and options there are. Um, and then we also are doing training um, for um, residents on how to be housing advocates. Um, so we have, we did a whole kind of series of trainings, um, some were in person, some were in Zoom, you know, how to speak at town meeting, how to support, you know, um, you know, initiatives at town meeting around housing. 
Um, so really training our citizens to be able to do that. So when these issues do come up, we can we can have people who are comfortable with doing that and feel like they can they can talk about these issues and get them passed at town meetings. So um, there's lots of other things we're doing, but that's sort of the really high level. I know Laura just kind of wanted um, you know the the high level update of, of of what HPCC is is up to, and I think. Um, definitely very excited to have um, this group, um, you know, be supporting what you are doing, be able to collaborate with you all, I think would be great. Um, and, you know, happy to continue that conversation. I know that's something we were very uh, excited about and feeling that, you know, working together um, is definitely going to be advantageous to all of us because um, we're all we're all working toward the same goals here. So, um, yeah. Thanks, Marissa. I want yeah. to emphasize to you that that training is available to folks on the vineyard. They've set up a lot of Zoom trainings, like how do you talk at town meeting? How do you attend town meeting? How mm -hmm. do you, you know, how do you attend a select board meeting and know when to speak and what, you know, what you can bring up? Um, so we'll we'll send out the information on those um, those Zooms, the Zoom training, so that folks from the island can access that. Um, Okay, everybody, I know this is a really dense meeting. We're trying to like get all of the background information out of the way in this meeting. And then in future meetings, we're gonna dive into more of the conversation stuff, but we're gonna have two fairly quick PowerPoints now. The first one is the state of housing. And this is gonna give a really broad brushstroke with very specific numbers though, so that you guys have a very clear picture of where we actually stand right now. Um, Alex, do you wanna share your screen? Okay, great, state of housing, next slide. So we rounded some of the numbers. There were a lot of like 2.975. It's really hard to digest, so these numbers are rounded, uh, but the source data has the exact numbers, and this is all Martha's Vineyard. Next slide. Okay, here are population figures, 2000, 2010, and 2020. So you can see our population going up. Below, there's the percentage increase. So that's that's where we are. We're at 20, approximately 20,500 right now. Next slide. So during this time, the cost of housing has doubled between 2012 and 2022. That's the average price. Next slide. Sorry, Alex, next slide, please. Oh, sorry, median. No, 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 go back. Sorry, my screen just glitched. So, um, nope, if you can go back to the median, please. Okay, so here's the median home price. 2012, it was $600,000. 10 years later, it's $1.5 million. That's an extraordinary and incredibly rapid escalation. Um, I'm not sure if Tucker's still here, but they were at one, just a little below 1.5 million in 2019 when they started ramping up their effort. And now they are well over $3 million. So we have an idea of where we're, where we're headed. Next slide, please. So we talk a lot about area median income. So here's a good visual. This is our county area median income. 100% of median income is 107,400 for a family of four. If you look down below, you're gonna see the disparity from town to town. And I think this is a really important thing to understand. The towns, frequently speak about differing needs. And this is why we're talking about different needs. You can see that Tisbury's median income is significantly lower than the other towns. And if you look at the difference between Tisbury and West Tisbury, there's an enormous difference right there. So when we're, when we're making decisions across the island, we have to be mindful about the different needs of the, the towns. Next slide, please. So, Affordable, capital A affordable, according to the state, we wanted to define this to help folks understand it. The state um, and federal considers that the level is 80% or below of the area median income. And you can see the list of what those, what those figures look like. That's the bulk of state funding is targeting those income limits and below. Alex, can you go to the next slide, please? So the funding sources that we're getting, and this is really important to understand, most of the state funding is limited to serving up to 80% of AMI. CPA, um, Community Preservation Act funds, which is the bulk of where, what our town money is for affordable housing, is restricted up to 100% of area median income. 
So even though Dukes County and Nantucket's municipal housing trusts can serve a higher range, and in Dukes County, our trusts can serve up to 150% of AMI, you can see that the revenue streams, the, the bulk of the revenue streams, the reliable year-over-year -year revenue streams cap out at 100% of AMI. So our trusts are not being, they don't have enough funding to increase the service range as robustly as we need them to. And you heard Provincetown and Nantucket talk about how they are, have been serving up to 200 and Nantucket's now increasing to 240. So we have an idea of you know, what, what, um, what'll work going forward. Next slide, please. So here's the range of AMI incomes. We thought it'd be useful. Folks I ask a lot, well, what does 150 look like? What does 170 look like? Um, so this is all posted on our website so you can take a closer look, but you can see two people at 150% of area median income, $128,900, what is that? You know, that's easily a municipal worker and a healthcare worker, right? Those folks are shut out of the market. They cannot for, afford, um, you know, one point something million dollar home. And there is essentially no rental inventory that's not deed restricted. And the deed restricted rentals, the wait list is over 300 people long. Next slide, please. Housing affordability gap. This is really important. This gets talked about at state level a lot. So our median single family home price is 1.3 million. Um, if you calculate out what the what housing what HUD considers to be affordable for a family earning one hundred seven thousand uh, dollars or earning one hundred seven thousand dollars, they say that a four hundred fifty two thousand dollar home is affordable for that family. Uh, you know that's doesn't leave a lot over for for many other things. But but even with that, the housing affordability gap for Dukes County is eight hundred and forty four thousand dollars. That's an extraordinarily high number. Next slide, please. This is how many of our households on the vineyard are now cost burdened. That means that they're spending more than 30% of their income on housing. We've seen a dramatic escalation in the number of folks accessing the island food pantry. And a lot of those folks are fully employed people because they're spending so much money on housing. So you can see how high those numbers are. Next slide, please. Existing housing stock. It's a total number of units in 2010 total number of units in 2020. So not an enormous increase. Um, occupied housing units, it went up. Um, part of the rise was due to um, COVID flight. So folks moving out here during the pandemic. Next slide, please. So inventory loss, this is really important. So 49% of our housing units currently are vacant for part of the year. So 51%, that means 51% of our inventory is occupied or year-round housing. Um, so, but what we also have to look at is how many units of year-round housing have we lost over the last 10 years? And from 2000 to 2020, we lost 600 units of year-round housing into the seasonal and short-term rental market. During that same period of time, we gained 1,400 seasonal units. So when we talk about creating new units, we have to assess that against the backdrop of what are we losing so that we don't wind up with a, a net loss. Next slide, please. A healthy vacancy rate for a rental um, inventory is 7% vacancy rate. Statewide, we're at 4%. The island's vacancy rate is currently 1.9%. So that is not clearly not a healthy uh, rental market. Next slide, please. Commonwealth's expectation is that 10% of housing stock in a community falls in the state's subsidized housing inventory. You hear about SHI a lot in these conversations. So the SHI is a housing stock that's deed restricted for households earning up to 80% of area median income. So let's take a look and see what that looks like on Martha's Vineyard. Next slide, please. Okay, those are our subsidized housing inventory. It says 2019. Um, these are a little bit more updated. Chilmark, ha Chilmark was at 0.7% in 2019, but the three units that they had restricted, the deed restriction expired. So Chilmark now is at zero. Um, Aquina has a very, very high number, largely due to tribal housing. Um, and these numbers, the 
DC, DHCD doesn't update this all that frequently. So we're actually waiting for the 2020 census and for reports from the towns to get this more accurate. I think Egger Towns has gone up a percentage point recently. Uh, but you can see the island needs 400 more units of year-round housing to just meet the state's 10% suggested threshold. Next slide, please. This is the, um, the folks who are waitlisted right now for housing. 323 on the rental wait list, 512 people on the home ownership wait list. Um, it was a significant number of applicants for the most recent lotteries, which far outstripped the supply. Next slide, please. Okay, so that's kind of where we are. It's, um, you know, not super sunny, but uh, we got to have the numbers if, we, if we're going to make a plan going forward. So uh, Alex, if you can pull that down and then put up Lucy's 10 point plan. What we did was we sat down with all this information and I've been attending affordable housing committee meetings, planning board meetings, um, really trying to, you know, whoopsie. That's not it. Alex, I think that is. Yeah, hang on one minute, I'll try to. Okay, great. So what we did was we came up with, we broke down all of these issues into 10 areas. And this is a suggestion. This is where we need community input, right? So when we were trying to figure out how to tackle this, this is a lot of information. It's a lot of issues. How, how do we break this down into like bite-sized pieces so we can really focus on this? So we broke it apart into 10 areas, which we're gonna put up on the screen for you now. Um, I'm gonna go through them really quickly and then we're gonna open it up for questions and comments as soon as Alex is able to find it. Do you have it, Alex? Yep. Um, this Super. might not fill the whole screen because there's something going on with PowerPoint, but this should be good okay. for everyone to see. Great. So here's how we broke it out. The top five, market demands, intertown communication, legislation, mechanisms, staffing capacity, and incentives. These are five things that as an island, we're not really focusing on right now. The bottom six through 10, these are five things that we are doing, but we can focus on more directly and really refine our approach to make it, um, you know, to make the impact more meaningful. Um, Alex, can you go to the next slide, please? So on the market demands, this is what Provincetown and Nantucket were talking about. It's really understanding what kind of pressure is on our market. Um, in order for us to self-determine, we've got to understand all this. Um, really be aware of new products that are coming on the market, fractional ownership, the planning boards are responding to that. And also as Tucker mentioned, really understand and address the need for seasonal workforce housing so that it's not competing with our year round inventory because that's what's happening right now. Um, next slide, please. Intertown communication and resource sharing. This is super important. If we do this, all the towns will have access to the same information. And we're trying really hard right now through the commission to make all of that information available. So not recreating the wheel, which leads to increased efficiency, cross-pollination, which has been working really well inside the Joint Affordable Housing Group. And it gives us an opportunity to tie into these pathways for state funding and also to influence new legislative mechanisms. There's a lot that's gonna be passed this legislative session. The governor is very pro-housing and we have an opportunity now, if we can figure out how to do it, to represent our voice together as an island to shape how this new legislation is actually forming as it's moving through committees. Um, and also increased opportunity for grants. If we apply as an island as six towns for grants, that really raises eyebrows at state level and it gives us a leg up for grant opportunities. Next slide, please. Legislation and mechanisms. So there's a new Department of Rural Affairs at state level. This has never existed before. This is gonna give a lot more resources to rural areas. Um, so that's being formed. So as, as islands, we have the opportunity to actually inform the state government as to how to create this Department of Rural Affairs so it really serves our needs. The other thing that HPCC has to protect Cape Cod has been working on regionally is something called a seasonal communities designation. Um, you might've heard the term gateway cities. That's a term that's applied to cities in Massachusetts that really opens them up to resources. Seasonal communities have a very specific set of needs as we know, and a designation would open us up to a whole bunch of tools and funding that we don't have right now. Um, as Leslie from Provincetown mentioned, um, a state mechanism that would allow us to deed restrict year-round housing and potentially um, 
come up with some programs that we could use that for. Housing for municipal workers, Nantucket's done quite a bit of that. They have, uh, they got special dispensation from the state to create um, town funded housing for sewer, for sewage treatment plant workers. And I know Edgartown is starting to look into how to do that. That's something that's really important to understand across all six towns so that if one town gets the right to do that, the other towns can explore how, how to also utilize that. Transfer fee in the regional housing bank, and then increased funding for a larger range of AMIs. Um, really, really helping the state understand that what works for the rest of the state is, you know, we need more here. We need a, a wider range here. Next slide, please. Staffing capacity. So this is really important. Um, Tucker Holland is the municipal housing director for Nantucket. That's not a position that exists on Martha's Vineyard. Um, so traditionally the methods of addressing housing, volunteer committees, we're not gonna be able to keep up with the intensity of the situation. And I think if we look to other communities and how they've addressed it when they've hit our point, um, they've looked at how to build capacity um, by actually creating positions and departments. Um, we don't know what that's gonna look like here, but it's an important conversation to have. And that always raises the question, you know, is it town by town? Is it island wide? Um, and monitoring and enforcement comes up and that's been a big topic in the towns. It's really hard to implement things if you can't monitor and enforce. So a really robust conversation around what would that look like? And then DCRHA and MVC capacity. These are two entities that are you know, of the towns. They are um, joint agencies that are created by the towns, funded by the towns and serve the towns. Um, and it's a great opportunity to look at how those can, you know, further serve the towns um, as capacity needs increase. Next slide. And I promise we're almost done. Incentives. Here's something we haven't really done. Um, P-Town's doing it, Nantucket's doing it too. Um, and thinking outside the box, Provincetown's transportation program. We are moving to a commuter community. So um, how do we keep those commuters commuting and not um, looking for jobs on the mainland? Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so here are the things that we're doing that we that would be really beneficial to, to really, really focus on. Preventing loss of housing. We have a lot of naturally occurring, quote unquote, affordable housing inventory. But if someone who bought their house for $200,000, you know, 25 years ago is selling and moving off the island, who's gonna buy that home? it's probably gonna sell for well over a million dollars and it will not be a local person or a year rounder who's buying it. So how do we keep that inventory locally, You know, keep that inventory year round and keep it local? Um, so creating mechanisms to do that, repurposing existing structures so we're not seeing so much tear down. It's a lot less expensive to preserve what we have than to create new. And then also it supports the integrity of the community's social fabric and our volunteer network. This is sort of the soft, um, hard to quantify issue that we're seeing disintegrate. When we lose our volunteer network, and this is a huge issue in rural communities that are facing situations like this, it puts an enormous strain on our formal services because our, our volunteer networks function as a to a large part our social services here in a lot of ways. Um, next slide, please. Zoning, we, you know, this is a huge topic of conversation. So there's a big menu of things that we can do for zoning. 40R is um, this really interesting overlay district that could be a really great tool, but we have to figure out how to apply it to very rural communities. Uh, next slide, please. Environmental impacts and waste management. Obviously this is a huge issue on the island and a big conversation. So beyond what we're already doing, um, I have in here, we have in here cultural shift, reducing the cultural ick factor. It's really hard for people to picture like actually dealing with human waste. So changing the conversation around that so that it's, you know, it's less of an icky thing to consider gives us a lot more options. Um, next slide, please. Infrastructure. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers is doing a carrying capacity study for Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket. So um, that's gonna be a really important study. And state population projections are about to come out. Martha's Vineyard's population is expected to decline. So we need to understand what that's gonna look like and how that's gonna impact our demographics. And then identify areas for adapting infrastructure that we currently have. Next slide.
Is that the last slide off? Oh, oh, and then finally production, that's the last one. Um, so doing what we're doing, but really creating more opportunities like Provincetown is doing for you know, private projects, public-private partnerships, um, infill and smart growth, and then providing support for design guidelines and technical support for private homeowners. We can stimulate the private market to solve a lot of these problems, but folks aren't gonna do it without resources. So um, you know, we can look to other communities and see what they've done. And that is it, that is the end of the information. So if everyone is still with us, we can open it up for questions or comments, or just, uh, I hope you don't all have your heads down on your desk now going, how are we gonna solve this? Um, well, I, I just wanna say <laughs> one thing that, you know, it was, there was a daunting, uh, you know, task that, that's ahead of us, but I do wanna, you know, talk a little bit positivity, you know, Egertown and Oak Bluff just passed large developments of, of affordable housing and hospital workers. And we did pass those things. I, Oak Bluffs is 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 coming back uh, with a second thing. Um, Hagertown passed Meshacket and uh, and the hospital housing, which were you know for a small rural community like Hagertown, those were big deals. So we have a lot to do. There's no question. But um, you know we're all here. There there are things that need to be done, and um, I do want to compliment you and the towns. We're just going to have to work together to you know dig our way out of it, and uh, that's what Provincetown is doing. That's what uh, Nantucket is doing, and you know we could certainly do it here. And that's what the goals of this organization is: is to discuss it, get the information out, and and um, you know figure out a path forward. So, Laura, we've got a few hands up, but the first thing I saw was a question in the chat, and that was, "How can the Dukes County Commissioners help?" I did not see that in the chat. Um, it came directly to me. You wouldn't. Oh, okay. How can the Dukes County Commissioners help? Um, yeah, well, so, so me, you're. Laura. <laughs> What's that? That's Was me, that you, Laura. Christine? Yeah. So, thank you. so, well, you guys are a government entity. So, any kind of support for legislation at state level, any way that you can get involved in that, that's a great, you know, Adam and I were talking earlier about, and, and Senator Sears brought this up too about, you know, Tucker is, he he represents the town of Nantucket. So when he speaks at state level and asks for changes to propose legislation to, in order to meet the needs of Nantucket, they have somebody on Nantucket who's able to do that and it's super effective. So one of the things that would be great on the island is to really figure out a way that we can, you know, the towns can join their voices and figure out how to represent those needs effectively at state level. And um, the county may be able to help facilitate that conversation. Yeah, there's also there's also funding and stuff that you can leverage mm -hmm. at a county level. Um, you know, uh, so I think I join with Laura and say, you know, the more we can do, um, you know, with the island wide sort of uh, voice like the county, we just you know we need to work with you. I agree. Thanks, Christine. Uh, first hand up was Ariel Faria. Hi there. Um, I'm curious um, to how you would advise municipalities to acquire the information, you know, like what Tucker has done, increasing the AMI or, you know, other initiatives that Providence has done. Uh, how do they get information on how they do it locally here because half the time that's the problem they don't know how that's a great question ariel can i ask you to identify yourself because i think there's some folks who don't know you here i am ariel faria i work for iht and i am co-chair for um the our ccmvhb um <laughs> the housing bank initiative thank you um, so everyone who who asks a question, I'm, I will ask that you identify yourself because we do have um, a lot of people on the call. So um, that's a great question. And in other locations, it's largely coming through. Um, it's coming from either pl professional planners or positions in the municipality that are responsible for actually doing the research. So 
while there is a volunteer affordable housing committee on Nantucket that's integral to the success of all their programs, in 2019, or in 20, I think 2017, Tucker Holland was hired and this new position was created. So there's a, you know, a fully trained, very active director of municipal housing with a staff, not a huge staff, but he has a staff. Um, and then Provincetown also has a community development director as a professional position and a housing resource person on staff in Provincetown. So um, I think that's something that that's another that was on the bullet points of things to think about. Like, is that is that something that the towns want to do individually town by town? Or is there a way that the Martha's Vineyard Commission can help support as a resource and build that resource from inside the commission? I mean, right now I am providing to a degree some of that resource to the towns, but obviously I'm one person, you know, resourcing six towns. So thinking about how to how to scale that up, I think is a valuable conversation. Thank that you. Could also, that could also be something that the county does. Um, sure. Have a, a housing a housing resource uh, person because they mm -hmm. they talk to all the towns too and are eligible for different kinds of funding than we as a special uh, authority might be. That would be great because as as much as I can appreciate that answer, Laura, it means more time. And what I heard over and over again is we don't have any more time and we need to mm -hmm. do things as quickly as we can. Thank you. Thanks. I'm writing these questions down, by the way, and I'm going to review this and I will also put together a comprehensive list and send that out after the um, after I get through it all. Um, Lucy, who's up next? Next up is Fred Hancock. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Fred Hancock. I am an MVC commissioner. Um, I wanted to to thank uh, Laura and everybody else who put this together because obviously this is a a, a, a very necessary kind of, of uh, program. One one thing I wanted to mention um, was it, in addition to the other statistics that Laura mentioned, I think we all know that our uh, year-round population on the island is also aging, uh, and we're aging fairly quickly. And I think while that presents some challenges to our uh, our housing situation, it also might present some opportunities. So I think it's something that uh, that might bear uh, some some thought. Thanks, Fred. Thanks, Fred. Uh, next up is Kate Putnam. Um, hi, I'm Kate Putnam. I live in Edgartown. And like Fred, I'm a Martha's Vineyard Commissioner. My question is about best practices in terms of zoning to take advantage of where sewer and water and public transportation lie now and how other towns here could be better using that to encourage uh, development that is appropriate to the area. Thanks, Kate. That's a great question, and I'm gonna um, I'm gonna let Adam answer some of that. Where well, that was that was a very one of the first things we did when yeah. I got here was to develop um, technologies and other work with others to develop technologies and solutions, so that um, you know when the when the time was right and the towns and others wanted to develop that uh, the provisions of, of of wastewater would not hold them back. It is a big issue because um, you know our ponds and other things are stressed and and you know we sell the island and people come to the island for environmental quality. So we had to develop these things, but they're they're developed now. We do have technologies that can be applied. Um, you saw in in Egertown, uh, we applied it to, I believe to the uh, Martha's Vineyard Hospital project. Um, and, um, and we are working with the towns, all of the towns, every town on this island has a sewer project or a, a, I guess I should say, a water quality project going on to basically look at, uh, you know, in, in, in the towns that have sewer, what that expansion is going to be in the towns that don't, what are the alternative systems that uh, can help them. So um, we need to work, you know, with them. There are, uh, like I said, every single town is is working on that, and hopefully that won't be a constraint 
uh, when towns and, and, and private developers, and I again, I point out, private developers look to, to the island and, and want to build housing. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Adam. Lucy, who's up? Uh, who's up next? Yeah, Kate, does that answer your question? Is that a yeah? No. No? It didn't. Kate, can you elaborate more? Are you talking about zoning? I, I'm basically saying what are what are the zoning best practices? I, I okay. get what Adam is doing and I appreciate the issue around sewer, but I'm I'm wondering what we can be doing to encourage. I mean, I look at Edgartown, which is dead in the middle of the wintertime, downtown Edgartown. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there's things that we could be doing that would encourage development where it is appropriate along the bus routes, um, where sewer and water already exist. Are there best practices around that that we can learn from each other, from other towns here on the island mm -hmm. or elsewhere that would give us uh, a roadmap to doing that well? So yes, the answer is yes. Lucy just put a link in the chat to the 2014 Martha's Vineyard Commission zoning analysis. So this needs to be updated and we have just started updating it. Um, so what this will do is compare the zoning across all of the towns, also do um, an assessment and link it to best practices and use some examples from other areas. There's also smart growth resources that we can bring in from the state level. Um, we're hoping that the District of Rural Affairs is gonna put more of an emphasis on what smart growth looks like in very rural areas. So it won't just be looking at like Egertown, Oak Bluffs and Tisbury, but it'll also help the up island towns look at smart growth. So um, we're really hoping to get the zoning analysis like done in the next couple months and then have that out for all the towns. That's a top priority. Yeah, I'll also go back to what I said though, Kate, all the towns are doing their CWMPs and other things. Those documents tell where their capacity is gonna be. Um, and it shows what they expect. They have build out analysis and all kinds of things where they basically say, look, our capacity is not unlimited. Here are the places that we expect to, um, to sewer. And um, in all the towns are gonna do that. How much in Tisbury, how much is State Road gonna be done? And in Oak Bluffs, I know they're looking at several different districts. So, um, you know, it's really important and it's being, those are meetings that, you know, um, will be out there for people to attend and look at what the capacities are. And for folks who aren't really familiar with like the, how wastewater capacity impacts housing, um, you can have a great plan for doing higher density around your town center, but if you don't have the sewer flow, you can't do it. So looking at those two things at the same time is, you know, really critical. Uh, next up is Rachel Orr. Hi, thank you. Um, a couple of things I was just hoping we could get some additional research on with this issue. Number one is the federal fair housing rules and how those apply to some of the focused housing needs we've talked about with municipal housing or other workforce housing, just so we have a really clear understanding of what we can and can't do. Um, to factor that in. So if we can add that to the conversation, I think that would be really helpful. Um, and the other thing, Laura, I really appreciated the slide showing the difference in the median incomes mm -hmm. with the island towns. Uh, I'm on Tisbury's Finance Committee. And if you also look at the state's environmental justice map, you will see that huge swaths of my town qualify as environmental justice neighborhoods. We are also a town that would, because we have town water and we have town sewer, it makes sense that we could avoid, you know, we could have some additional density. Um, but anytime you have deed restrictions that impacts tax revenue and carrying financial carrying capacity of the town. So if as part of these conversations, we could um, think about those things and how we can make that work as an island so it's fair. Um, I don't know what that looks like, but I think it would be a very helpful part of the conversation going forward, if we could have more information uh, just and also really talk about um, how to make this work for everybody so it's not an undue burden on one already burdened community. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, next up is Elaine Miller. 
Hi there, uh, Elaine Miller, uh, Tisbury Planning Board, and a couple of other things as well. Um, you know, I think that uh, there are so many issues that we discussed, and they're all critical. I mean, the zoning analysis is very, very important for us to see, and the sooner that we get that, the better we're going to get it. Um, I also think it would be really helpful because I have attended the HPCC meetings along with Leslie and Tucker Holland, and they have such an energy and a positive approach. And, you know, Provincetown has a capacity of 3,000 people, and they're doing incredible things there. And I think they're great role models for us to follow. And if we could, and they have uh, Leslie offered to come, and I think if we could get some some of them to both Leslie and Tucker here just to stimulate us and get us going because they have they've already taken the path and we can follow that path and I think having them here would be helpful and also you know the municipal leadership training would be really wonderful to get here on the island as well uh, let's get some of that energy here and let's capture it and let's just take follow on we've got to get this solved for sure thanks Thanks, Elaine. Thanks, Elaine. Uh, next up is Doug Ruskin. And then Doug, you're muted. Thank you. Um, I'm a director of the Island Housing Trust. I've been on the board for a number of years and I'm currently a county commissioner. Um, I, first of all, I want to thank both Adam and, and Laura for pulling this together. It's uh, it's impossible to solve a problem if you don't have the data. And that's one of the things you guys excel at. Um, I, I would like to raise a question that I don't expect to be answered tonight. Uh, this being the very first meeting of, of the Martha's Vineyard Commission Housing Task Force, or if I have that name right. Um, but what is the overarching mission of the task force? Uh, we have upwards of 70 people here tonight. Uh, I'm assuming that the task force is not 70 people. So um, I think we could all benefit from some definition over the next meeting or two. Um, the other thing uh, that I wanted to address was what I think of as low hanging fruit. Um, I spent a lot of years in um, small business process re-implementation and one of the things we always looked for when we had complex problems was what what could we solve or what could we do relatively quickly that gave people some positive feedback and more hope we have an enormous problem uh, it took an hour uh, to go through all of the various issues um, and and the slide deck was great because it really covered everything uh, or almost everything but one of the things we can do, I think, quickly, as we're building out more units, is stop the bleeding or work to stop the bleeding or slow the bleeding. We are um, losing units, you documented that, for, for the most part at this point to um, short-term rentals that are being bought up to a great extent by non-island entities corporate corporations and investment bankers and so forth. The most recent uh, example of that is on uh, is down in Edgartown where the whole neighborhood is up in arms where somebody's trying to uh, maximize the monetary benefit of, of a property on the harbor. Um, that can be addressed relatively quickly, I think, with regulations that we don't need the state for. They're, the uh, requirement is built into the short-term rental legislation. Um, we just need to move as quickly as possible on it. So that's uh, one thing. And then the other, as Laura pointed out, um, Nantucket and Providence Town have <coughs> paid professional housing folks um, who are tasked not only with uh, analyzing, but also implementing. And that's something I think we really can address relatively quickly as well. The Martha's Vineyard Commission is just not an implementing organization. Um, and and it, you know all the great work that's being done is necessary, but obviously not enough. So I think that's another uh, item that can be attacked relatively quickly uh, if we can get our arms around it. Thank you. 
Thanks, Doug. And I do want to just address that. Um, those are all really important points. That first question of how are we going to organize the task force, um, that's going to be the subject for the next conversation. Um, one of the ideas of breaking apart the problem into those 10 areas of focus is to start trying to think about how we can create like subgroups that are really focusing on those 10 specific areas and coming up with a game plan like the climate action task force has done with measurable goals a timeline and a plan forward for implementation so you know we haven't decided how to do this at all this is you know we're throwing this out to the community to say how do we support the community in doing this but based on that roadmap that's sort of how we're like loosely envisioning this moving forward Okay, uh, next up is Jeffrey Dubard. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I am Jeffrey Dubard. I'm on the West Hillsbury Affordable Housing Committee and uh, the Board of Island Housing Trust. Um, and thank you guys for such a well organized, informative gathered. I um, and to the other towns affordable housing committees. I think it would be great for, for all six of us to have um, a joint meeting at some point, which has been mentioned here, to figure out some of the things that sort of we within our, our towns can do collectively. But uh, Laura, I was just curious, uh, I don't remember if it was Provincetown or Nantucket who had mentioned conservation um, and it in its current practices largely being um, an opposing force and certainly um, supporting a stratified housing structure. Um, I wonder if there's been any dialogue or if there is a way for us to encourage a dialogue with, you know, the particularly the land bank, uh, because it seems that there are ways that that their resources, rather than sort of preserving healthy, beautiful land and exclusive places might be used to make land healthier and um, support housing in our denser down island towns? Well, so I think it was Julian who talked about the stratification. Oh, yeah. I've heard him talk about that before. I just want to clarify. I think what I heard from P-Town and Nantucket was that it's a factor, but they didn't put a value judgment on it because I know that, you know, the Tucker works, he's works very closely with the conservation groups on Nantucket. And I know P-Town also, they really value their conservation land. So the question becomes like, how do you work in that environment? And I think for, so for the land bank, they have done, I think over 15 significant projects partnering with affordable housing. What, what I've raised recently, and this kind of gets to capacity, is that the way the land bank structured is they're, they're kind of structured um, to receive proposals like from the towns, like I know, the land bank put out a request to all the affordable housing committees if you have parcels that you think would be appropriate to partner with the land bank to do jointly conservation and affordable housing we want to hear from you but what, but because we have volunteer affordable housing committees who are working maxed out working to capacity right now and we don't really have professional staff in the towns to identify those parcels and go looking for real estate like that there's a limit to what can come to the land bank as far as proposals. So I think it's definitely worth, and I, I've broached this conversation with James to say, can we think about how, you know, because of the limited resources of the towns, how can we start thinking about it in a more like, you know, sending the information in the opposite direction? So um, I think it's a valuable conversation to be had. The land bank, I mean, the island is, is not as overdeveloped as it could be largely due to the efforts of the land bank. So I think it's important not to pit conservation and housing against each other, but to really figure out how those two, you know, can work together. Yeah, I, and just to be clear, I mean, that's sort of what I'm suggesting and mm -hmm. and rather than sort of individual projects, I, I, I was speaking more towards, you know, there's obviously a nitrogen problem uh, mm -hmm. in our lagoons. So, which hinders the ability to increase housing stock in some areas where it could be denser. So the land bank could, funds could be used to increase the nitrogen capacity in those areas by 
having a restriction, having ownership of of land, which then impacts. So I, it, it's it's just more of a dialogue about more innovative, sort of progressive ideas. That's um, great. And, Thank and you. Break down them if we could. I am making a note. Thank you. Okay, who's up next? And then I think we'll try to wrap it up. We, it looks like we have two, is it two more questions? If we've got three hands. Uh, John Schaefer's next. Okay. John, are you there? Uh, John, you are muted. Uh, while he, John's figuring that out, maybe we should move on to John Abrams. Thanks, Lucy. I just want to echo all the applause for the commission for hiring Laura, for getting this going. Um, it seems like a seminal moment to me in, in our you know, 30 or 40 year work to solve this crisis. And I just want to point out that it was so great to hear from town leadership in Provincetown town leadership in Nantucket. And of these 70 people here tonight, there were maybe three or four vineyard select board members. We don't, you know, if we were one island and one town, as Provincetown is, as Nantucket is, we would be able to tackle these problems so much better. And so, where do we get that kind of centralization? Where do we get, and, and maybe it is, maybe it has to lie in the realm of the commission because, and the county commissioners, because that's all we've got. We have such a siloed approach to solving problems. So um, anything we can do to bring the towns together as one entity, because we are so one island, is going to make these things go faster, better. Um, so I hope that'll be part, um, Laura and Adam, of what you do. And it seems like it is to bring together, you know, during the pandemic, it's the first time I ever saw the island act as one town. We can do it. So I hope we can do that better. Uh, thanks again, Laura and Adam and everybody here. Thanks, John. Uh, so let's like to John Schaefer. Yeah, I, I was. Uh, I'm sorry, I was in and out for for a bit. I'm on the Island Housing Trust Board. Had been a board member of the hospital and involved in the workforce housing there, and also I'm on the Sheriff's Meadow Board, so I'm sort of conservation. I, I would hope, and again, if I missed it that we broaden the definition of what we're trying to do to include workforce housing and to be a resource for companies or employers who are looking to try to solve the problem themselves that need some help trying to think of how to do that or collectively come together to do that. So that while affordable housing is very important, there's a big donut hole, as you all know, where it's not affordable, but we still need workforce housing. And so anything this group can do to support workforce housing broadly uh, to help as a resource, I think would be great. Thanks, Jen. Yeah, 100%. That's exactly what Provincetown and Nantucket are doing. And I think that was, you know, one of the things that they really emphasized with us in prior conversations was increasing the range of folks that we can serve because it really, you know, once your median home price hits like $1.9 million and starts going over two, it's basically everybody. It's your whole year round community. It's your entire workforce. Mm -hmm. There was there one more question or? Oh, we've got Ariel Faria again. It's okay, just and me one more time and really quickly. Okay. <laughs> I, I just wanted to add on to what you and what Jeffrey Dubard said. Um, you know, you stated that we needed you know paid professionals to be in these positions to help implement. Um, you know, the work that we're doing in the towns. Um, I totally think that we all need to advocate for those positions to get things done, which means allocating money towards that. But also to what Jeffrey was saying about, you know, infrastructure issues, what wastewater and all of that in order to be able to produce housing. Um, you know, Senator Sear 
stated that we were not taking advantage of all the funding that we have available to us in that manner. And so that we all also need to advocate and encourage our um, municipalities and, 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 and the uh, people in, you know, higher places to actually do what's necessary in order to accomplish um, uh, those goals. We have to allocate money to the right places. We can't just keep get, getting tax cuts for no reason. You know, it, it, we have to actually make more efforts. So anyway, everyone here is for housing. You have to show up and talk to your officials and make sure that they're putting their money in the right places. Thanks, Ariel. I saw two hands go up quick. So if we can <laughs> wrap this up in, if you guys can have take two minutes each and then we're gonna call it a night. I don't know who was first, Lucy, did you see? First we've got Rachel Orr and then Christine. Okay. Um, just quickly, I spoke with our town financial people about the Cape and Islands Fund that Julian Sear discussed. And um, for my town there, the financial leadership, professional financial leadership was not in favor of that fund because the money is pooled and there's no guarantee that island money will stay on island. Um, there was no mechanism to make sure any of it was spent here. So maybe that's something we can discuss with our legislators. Um, I think it would be a more attractive option if we knew that some of the pooled money was coming back to the vineyard. That's an yeah, Adam. Uh, you want to address that, Adam? Absolutely. I, I think you need to look at what's going on in the Cape because there are smaller towns and larger towns, and the money has been distributed quite equity, quite equitably, I guess is that the word. Um, but I'd be glad to get you the information as to but they've spent $100 million over there. And um, like I said, Truro is getting its fair share as opposed to um, so is Mashpee. So I'd be glad to share that and and um and try to get you some information on the fiscal part of it. Thanks, Adam. Um, Christine Todd, back to you. Yes, thank you, Lucy. So I just wanted to say, I mean, this is great having this dialogue tonight. Uh, unbelievable and certainly something we should continue with. Um, the county is really trying and working hard to take funding that we got from ARPA funds, three point some odd million dollars and putting it toward wastewater, which will help not only at the airport business park, but also nitrogen well, loading, um, you know, facilities on the island. We're, we are working really hard to deal with the issues that are, you know, presenting, um, you know, concerns to our, our uh, health concerns in our ponds, et cetera. We're working really hard for that. And I think that it's really important that what Ariel said and what, um, forget who else said, you know, we have to work as a county, you know, six towns together, try to find ways to tackle this, not town by town, but island wide. I think that's where we're going to find our best solutions. And so whatever anyone can do, you know, to help contribute to that effort is fine by me. That's it. Thanks. I, thanks, Lucy. I think, um, if everybody's okay with it, I think we're going to call it a night. That was an incredibly productive first outing. I want to thank everybody for showing up, all the presenters who came, all the questions. And um, so, so there's there's a lot that there's a lot to do, but we're on our way and there's a lot that can be done. And the most important thing is really community. Frankly, it's community culture. You see pol really, really good policy not get implemented because the culture doesn't support it. So this is the most important thing is creating the community culture that says this is a community value, housing is infrastructure, you know, our human infrastructure is incredibly important and that's gonna set the tone for making progress going forward. So thank you to everybody. And um, we'll put this up again on the YouTube channel if you wanna share this out. And I will, um, I'll take some notes and I'll try to get kind of like a menu of questions and and topics out to everybody. And then Lucy and Adam and I will talk about what the next step is when we're going to have the next meeting and you know how we're going to structure that conversation. One thing, um, just before we adjourn, if you had, you know, people, I just got a couple of texts that, man, you know, this is a difficult problem. Um, and maybe a little bit of a difficult meeting in terms of where we are. But if you look at the first meeting we had of the climate change task force, it was about the same thing that, you know, mm -hmm. 
we're five years already too long, too late. And but we have done a lot of good stuff. We've brought a lot of funds. We have a lot of consensus. We're move, we have a plan to move forward. And um, we just got to work together town by town and, and island by island and, and we'll get there. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Lucy, everyone. Our Good pleasure. Night. Good night, everyone. See you next time. <laughs>